The first encounter with whatever this thing is was when I was running on a trail in the woods behind my elementary school. I got halfway through when I heard a UFO-esque warble, something I've never heard before. I looked up in the tree I heard it come from and saw something that looked like a mix between what could have been a monkey and a bird. It had the body of a monkey or some mammal, four limbs and brown fur, and the head of a bird, bird-shaped head with beak and feathers. Also, after I spotted it, and it ran off quickly for the rest of the time I was on the trail, stuff kept falling around me, like branches and acorns. And this didn't happen until I spotted it. I thought I was hallucinating after encountering it, but later that month I was on a different trail behind my high school this time, when I encountered it again. I was going through the trail when I started to hear wolves howling, which is weird because wolves don't live in my area to my knowledge. At that point, I started to pick up the pace because I don't want to be eaten. Eventually, I hear S moving in the trees, and at one point I spot the damn bird monkey again. After that, the howling got closer and stuff started to fall around me again. I'm usually calm, but I started to get a little nervous. Eventually, I get to the end of the trail, and that's when I hear what sounds like a dog whimpering in a nearby bush. Crap, still dropping around me, and the howling is getting closer, but I stopped because it could be a dog in distress. I eventually left it without checking, though, because with everything going on, it probably wasn't a dog. I don't know if the howling and dog were connected, but I added it anyway, as it all happened in the same encounter. I have no clue what bird monkey thing it is or its name, but any help would be appreciated. I will add that the woods behind my high school and elementary school are very haunted. I've done a ton of ghost hunting and night. I can always put my other ghost cryptid stories up if wanted. I've been a park ranger for over a decade, and in that time, I've seen some incredible things. But nothing could have prepared me for the truth about what was really happening in the national park where I worked. It all started when I noticed that there had been an unusually high number of disappearances in the park. Hikers, campers, and even other park rangers had vanished without a trace, and despite our best efforts, we couldn't find any clues as to what had happened to them. That's when I started to notice something strange. My supervisor and some of my colleagues seemed to be hiding something from me. They would speak in hushed tones when I was around, and I could sense that they were holding back information from me. Finally, I confronted my supervisor, demanding to know what was really going on in the park. That's when he revealed the truth. There were unknown predators in the park, creatures that were preying on hikers and campers and even other park rangers. I was shocked and horrified by this revelation, but what really terrified me was the fact that my colleagues had been keeping this information from me. How long had they known about these creatures? And why hadn't they done more to warn people or protect them from harm? I knew that I couldn't keep this information to myself. I went to the media and shared the truth about what was really happening in the park. But instead of being praised for my bravery, I was fired from my job as a park ranger. Now I'm on the run, pursued by the very people I used to work alongside. But I won't stop until the truth about the unknown predators in the park is exposed. I know that it's dangerous and that these creatures could come after me at any moment. But I won't rest until justice is served and the innocent people who have vanished in the park are given the answers they deserve. In 1981, my friends lived in a very rural cabin near Baxter State Park, Maine. The road was only traveled by the residents. You could drive on it and not expect to see any other cars. I was driving up there one night. As I went around the last bend before reaching the cabin, an eight-foot-tall Sasquatch was standing on the side of the road. It was massive. It had to be four feet across the shoulders with brownish-blonde hair. I then noticed that it was a male. His skin was dark. The face had a long beard and looked both ape-like and human-like. He stood there motionless looking at me. I was freaked out when my headlights were on him and we actually made contact. He was not twenty feet from me. I sped past and then into my friend's driveway. I ran into the cabin screaming that I had seen a huge Sasquatch. A few years later I bought a small property near Mount Blue State Park, Maine. 
One winter, a friend was visiting from Utah. My boyfriend and his friends went out on the snowmobiles at night. Later, we were inside the cabin and started hearing these bizarre growls like no noise I'd ever heard before or since. The growls got louder and louder, and then whatever this was started screaming, literally shaking the cabin. It was right outside. I ran toward the door and placed a board barricade through the loop. As soon as I did, that something was pulling and shaking the door on the other side. Each time we changed our position in the cabin, that part of the cabin would be attacked. We were terrified. My boyfriend had brought a pistol, so I grabbed it. We climbed the ladder to the bedroom. Whatever that thing was landed on the roof above us, its screams were the scariest things you have ever heard and they're impossible to repeat. Just as we thought our lives were over, we could hear the snowmobiles coming back. Whatever that thing was finally ran off. We told the guys what had happened, and they went out to look for tracks. At first, they thought we were crazy until they saw huge unknown prints with long claw marks in the snow. There were deep scratches on the window frames and outside walls. My boyfriend was an experienced hunter. He couldn't explain the prints or the deep claw marks. I soon moved out west to California. There is no way I was staying in that cabin, let alone in Maine. I just got back from a week-long trip to Florida. My fiancé and I were visiting her parents, who own a home in Boca Raton, and I was hoping to get a fishing trip in with her father Jim while I was there. The Everglades aren't too far from where they live, and her dad owned a small boat. And since he's retired, he spends a good deal of time taking it out on some of the local lakes. I ran the idea of fishing the glades past him, and he seemed to be just as excited as me. Despite being in the vicinity, he had actually never fished it. Well, a few days after we got there, we made arrangements and set out early in the morning, towing his boat behind us. It wasn't one of the boats from the movies. You know, with the big fans. It was a nice little 14-foot tracker, which was perfect for the narrow waterways. We're both kind of anti-technology YouTube videos, and computer solitaire is the extent of our interest. Select fools, neither one of us brought a satellite GPS and we both left our phones in the truck. Anyway, we got to the glades and got the boat in the water around nine. We planned to fish around two and then head back home and be there in time for dinner. We hadn't planned on getting lost. It was a blast at first. We saw a few alligators, which I'd never seen in the wild. We stopped to fish a few times and even caught a few large mouths each, I guess around 1 p.m. when we figured we should start heading back in the direction we came. We were both adept at navigation and kept aware of when and where we had turned, but it didn't really help. We had seriously underestimated the labyrinth of channels and canals, and it didn't take us long to realize that we'd gotten lost in the maze of the Everglades. We weren't panicking yet. But by this time it was well past 2 p.m., and we couldn't tell if we'd made any progress or not, we had just come around the turn of yet another channel when I saw something bizarre. Some thing that had been standing along one of the banks dove into the water just as we made the turn. I only caught a glimpse of it, but it had been standing upright on two legs and had a green scaly complexion. I convinced myself that it was just an alligator and maybe the sun had caught it at a weird angle. Besides, we had bigger problems. The sun was getting low in the sky, and we hadn't seen a single other person. We didn't have much water, and we were still completely lost. I really regret thinking I was macho enough to not need a GPS. A few canals later, I happened to turn around and caught sight of something in the water right behind the boat. It looked like an alligator, but it was moving way too fast, and it was speeding directly towards me. I was in the back on the motor, and I gunned the throttle in surprised response. A bunch of things happened at once. Not expecting the sudden shift in speed, my soon-to-be father-in-law fell back against the side of the boat and tumbled into the water. At the same time, the creature that had been tailing us rose out of the water and lashed out toward me with a set of razor-sharp claws. When I say rose, I mean stood up on two legs like a human would. Gunning the engine is probably what saved me, as the swipe fell short. I burst forward a few feet and got a good look at this thing. The water was around five feet deep there, 
and this thing was standing up the waterline around its waist. It had a pair of thickly muscled arms, each sporting one of those clawed fists at an almost decapitated me. Greenish-black scales ran the length of it and then terminated in a flat head, jaw open, bearing two rows of serrated teeth. I saw Jim hit the water and immediately start splashing around. I knew he could swim, but being launched from a boat into alligator-infested waters is probably the kind of thing to cause you to panic. The only problem was that this thing was between me and Jim. I couldn't leave him and I couldn't get around this thing, there was no room. I'm not saying I'm brave because I certainly didn't feel courageous in the moment. But I turned the boat around quickly, twisted the throttle as far as I could and charge. The bow of the boat lifted into the air. I couldn't see past it, but I felt an impact and the boat shuddered, almost tipping to the left. I let go of the throttle and pulled alongside the frantic Jim and grabbed his arm. I started hauling him in and looked back over my shoulder. The wake from the short burst was lapping against both sides of the channel, and thick rings of water flowing away from where I guessed the creature had been. It was nowhere in sight. I brought Jim into the boat and, not too gently, threw him to the deck, plopped back down next to the motor, and sped away up the channel. We didn't see the creature again. After a few hours, we eventually ran into a group of guys who led us back to the boat ramp. We were only about twenty minutes away and had pretty much been going in circles the whole time. We each had about a dozen missed calls from our wives. I think Jim was pretty upset with me, but eventually he came around and laughed it off. He had never actually seen the thing and thought I had just overreacted to an alligator, but I know that it wasn't. Alligators don't stand on two feet, and they don't attack with their claws. I don't know if it's a species of animal that hasn't been encountered yet or a weird human-alligator hybrid, but whatever it is, it probably shouldn't exist. Good afternoon. I am an Orthodox priest from Russia. In 2021, in the Crimea in the mountains above Yalta, I personally saw Bigfoot. It was attracted by the sound of the whistle on which I played in the Ukosh track. Bigfoot went out to a rock located opposite the west of me. I was on the east side of the gorge. There were about 300 meters between us. It looked tall, strikingly taller than a man, massive body and shoulders, long arms and long legs. While I took out the camera to photograph him, he went up the slope with huge steps of about two meters approximately. When I photographed the place where he was, all the pictures were overexposed, and my Canon EOS 5D Mark II let me down for the first time. Such is the short story of my second in such a bright meeting with Bigfoot. Earlier this year in March, I was in my work van driving from Warning Lide to Littlehampton, West Sussex, to start my deliveries. It was early morning around five, um... Still pitch black, but weather was clear. I was driving southbound on the A24 and had just passed the southern tip of the village of Ashington, soon to be approaching the Storrington Roundabout. On my left-hand side, there is a section of grass that runs for a few hundred feet and is about six feet wide or so before it becomes a huge thicket of brambles. I saw a creature that I can only describe as cardboard box color, it was about four feet tall, but down on its haunches to where its heels were touching its butt. It was facing diagonally away from me into the base of the bushes, so I saw its back and left side of its body more so than anything else. Its spine was showing, and also ribs, but not to the extreme, and it had small round ears that were in the location of a human's, but shaped in a similar way as to what a black bear's are. It had a tail that rose up into a subtle S-shape, was very skinny and seemed to be hairless like the rest of the animal. The face, from what I could see, had a muzzle, but not extremely pronounced, and it seemed to be tracking something in the grass. My guess would be some kind of rodent. Its head movements were very digital and all over the place, and it jumped like how a fox would when pouncing, but in doing so, I saw the soles of the feet which I remember extremely clearly as they looked like ours. But given the hours that I'm awake and the fact I'm a proper country boy, I see multiple foxes on a daily. This was as far from a fox as a monkey is. It was nothing 
I had ever seen before in person, on tele, internet, or in books. The duration lasted about five seconds, and as soon as I saw it, I had shivers all over my body, and I literally said out loud what the F was that. I couldn't believe my eyes. I got to the roundabout, probably thirty seconds later, and doubled back on myself to get back into the same road again in hopes I could get a second glimpse, but I wasn't lucky. The thing about it all that was almost stranger than the sighting itself was that I had such a strong feeling of shame that came over me. I felt so shameful in seeing it and have no idea why. I remember being in tears because of it, and I don't fully understand why, but I felt like I had no business seeing it, and if I had a regular job that never required me to be up so early, then I never would have. Still no idea what it was. If anyone has seen anything similar, please share or has any insight, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. My infant daughter and I had driven up north from Kamloops, British Columbia for the day, to visit my mother. We had gone out to dinner, and my baby girl fell asleep in the middle. We put her in the carrier and covered her with a new pink blanket. When dinner was over, we said our goodbyes. Away we went. It was about 10 p.m. by the time we got on the road, and we had a good two-hour drive ahead. I was glad that the next day was a Sunday, and I would be able to catch up on some sleep. I played music quietly to keep me alert, and it worked for the first hour and a half of my drive, but at about 11.30 p.m., something else happened that made me more alert than I've ever been in my entire life. It was very dark, and the lights along this rural road were spaced out pretty far, so my headlights were the only lights I could rely on, but as I turned along a slow curve, I saw something ahead. On the right side of the road was a creek, and in order to make sure there were no incidents with people driving into the gully, a guardrail was in place. It had cement blocks attached every so often that held the lights in place. As my high beam stretched brightly into the darkness, I saw something on the cement block up ahead. I squinted to make out the dark silhouette. Just then, the figure leaped from the cement block and flew through the air. It landed solidly on the road directly in my path. I watched as it slowly began to stand up tall and raise its arms over its head. I saw the muscular thing stretch until it had shown its full height. About two and a half meters tall, its furry arms were wide. They waved wildly in the air, and as I approached my car, I could see its muscular build. At first, when it was still on the side of the road, I thought it was a black bear trying to hunt, since deer are prevalent in this area. But as it stood there, I could see the human-like qualities of its limbs and face. It looked like a giant. A very hairy, ugly, naked man. Then it did something completely unexpected. It crouched down, and I thought it was going to jump back into the forest that surrounded us. But instead, it laid down, stretching its full body across the lane. It was too late for me to stop or swerve. I hit him, or whatever it was. I hit it with my Honda Accord. I had expected there to be a huge crunching sound, and my thoughts immediately went to my sleeping baby. Would we get hurt? Would our car be drivable? I didn't want us to be stranded, but to my surprise, we rolled over it pretty easily. There was a thumping sensation, and I knew that the position of my car had made me run over its head. I felt sick, thinking I could have killed someone or some poor creature, but the image of it standing in the road made me uneasy enough to assault my guilt. I stopped the car for a moment. When we had gone about 100 meters or so, I looked in my rearview mirror to see it laying there still, illuminated by my brake lights. It wasn't moving. Panic, fear, and concern flooded me in a mix of waves of emotion. I thought about getting out of the car, but I worried that maybe it was still alive and angry. I couldn't risk getting hurt, not with my baby in the car. That's when I made the decision that still haunts me. I floored the accelerator, and I didn't stop until I got home. When we finally pulled into my driveway, I felt safe. I immediately grabbed the carrier with my baby, and I went inside. After putting her into her crib, I paced the house. The rest of my family was out of town, and unreachable by phone. I had no idea what to do. After worrying and pacing, I finally decided to call the provincial police. 
I knew that no one would take my call seriously if I said it was a Sasquatch. After the call, I went out to check the damage to the car. I feared the worst. I really thought that I would have to explain the unexplainable to the mechanic. But the damage was minimal. Only the license plate was bent, and on one of the bolts, I had found hairs from the creature. I thought about keeping it, but reasoned that it was crazy and threw it out. No one would believe me. I called the police the next day to check and found that there was no record of my call, and nothing suspicious was reported along any of the country roads. When my family returned, I told them the story. Of course, they thought I was making it up. After a while, I stopped talking about it. My family still makes fun of me, but I've learned not to respond. But I know what really happened that night, and I know it's still out there. Thanks for listening, dear ghouls. Hope you enjoyed these stories. Do comment, like, and subscribe. If not for us, then for YouTube algorithm that helps push the video to the greater audience. Thank you, dear family.